Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ELEX webinar, Densho Digital Repository, Preserving Community Memory, which is a part of Preservation Week. I'm Frances Harrell, the co-chair of the ELEX PARS Preservation Outreach Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Jeff Rowe and Sarah Beckman from Densho. Jeff Rowe is Densho's deputy director. Though trained as a social scientist, Jeff has over two decades of experience developing technology and information management strategies for a variety of for-profit and nonprofit ventures, ranging from small think tanks and startups to the Department of State, Adobe Corporation, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Most recently, Jeff served as the Chief Information Officer of Health Alliance International, an NGO engaged in global health work. Sarah Beckman is a digitization technician at Densho. She graduated from Indiana State University with a BS in History and from University of Washington with a Master's in Library and Information Science. She moved to the Seattle area in 2010 and loves her adopted home. Sarah knew almost nothing about Japanese American incarceration upon joining Den Show as an intern in 2015. Now she hopes to help spread awareness to the wider public with her work on the Den Show Digital Repository. Their presentation today will discuss Densho, a Seattle-based grassroots organization with a mission to preserve the stories of the Japanese American experience during World War II and to educate, collaborate, and inspire action for equity. A few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. The webinar today does not have interactive chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you should go ahead and do that using the hashtags you see on the screen. We will not be monitoring the Twitter feed. If you have questions for Jeff or Sarah, please type them into the question box on your screen and they will answer them as time permits at the end of the presentation. Questions which remain unanswered while we were on the air will be answered offline and the answers sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started now. There may be a slight delay as we turn the presentation over to Jeff and Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, um, Alex and the ALA for allowing us to share this presentation during uh, 2018 Preservation Week. I'm uh, Jeff Fro, uh, the Deputy Director here at Densho, and I'm here with... Sarah Beckman, and I'm the newly minted Assistant Digital Archivist. I, I just accepted the position a couple weeks ago, actually. That's right, we're happy to have you join us full time. So um, uh, today we're going to give you just a brief overview of Densho, the Japanese American Legacy Project, and our activities, and focus particularly on archival work and how that connects to um, the, our community work as well. Um, but first, we wanted to do just a quick poll and find out a little bit more about everyone in the audience. So if we've got two poll questions, and we're going to put those, we could put those up. Um, and I think that goes to Catherine to put those up. Let's see. Let's see if we can put that. <laughs> Not quite sure how this uh, how this works here. All right, they're coming. Oh, they're coming. Okay. All right. No problem. So in just just a moment. Yeah. So the polling is always kind of complicated. But okay. So the first question, and I. I think this should be showing. Yes. Good. Um, is do you work in the library, archives, or museum sector professionally? Uh, so please choose the best answer. Um, and again, I know that there are probably some folks watching this uh, in a group setting, so you don't have to all answer, but we just wanted to get an idea of those of you um, out there. So, and we'll just take a few minutes for that. Or a few, sorry, not a few minutes, maybe about a, uh, about 30 seconds or so for that, for everyone to, uh, to put some answers in. And if we've had some responses, maybe Catherine, if you could flip it to the second question. Or the results, whichever. <laughs> oh, great, or the results, perfect. Oh, 
Fantastic. All right. Well, that is a lot of people, um, 84% who are uh, library professionals, which is great. I would, I would expect that during, uh, during preservation week. Um, terrific. All right. So the second question we have is how much, whoops, second question is how much do you know about the Japanese American World War II incarceration experience? And we'll give just a little bit of time for that as well. I feel like we need the Jeopardy music. I, I do too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very quiet suddenly. <laughs> but. All right, how about we check on the answers for that one? And okay, somewhat familiar. So it looks so it looks like actually a, a fair amount of uh, of of um, familiarity out there. Um, so that's good. So I will uh, be able to spend a little bit less time on the background of uh, the Japanese American incarceration. But uh, thanks for sharing about, uh, about yourselves. And again, thank you everyone for taking the time to uh, participate today. So let's Sorry, I'm just going to go to the next slide here. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of background. It sounds like people have uh, some idea um, of what happened during the Japanese American incarceration, but just to frame um, what it is that we do, um, I'm going to give you just a, a very brief uh, timeline of the overall experience. So it really starts in uh, between 1885 and 1924. Uh, about 180,000 Japanese immigrated to the U.S. mainland, mainly to the West Coast, and about at the same time, about 200,000 um, uh, immigrated into Hawaii. Um, during this period, this first generation, who we call the Issei, um, you know, built communities, built built lives, were uh, very successful in agriculture, in uh, small business and really thrived. Um, there was quite a bit of prejudice and sort of anti-Japanese uh, political activity on the West Coast in particular, some in Hawaii, but mostly um, on the mainland directed against this, uh, this new community. And that resulted in a series of laws culminating in 1924 with the passage of the Immigration Act of 1924 by Congress, which completely cut off uh, immigration from, um, from Japan to the United States. Um, at the same time, there were a series of laws that were passed in uh, California, in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, across the West Coast, um, targeting Japanese Americans, in, or targeting Japanese in particular. Um, important to note that Issei, first generation Japanese, uh, immigrants were not eligible to become naturalized. That is, they, they could not become citizens. Uh, their children, however, the Nisei, the second generation, um, were citizens uh, by, by birth. And in fact, in many jurisdictions where Issei were uh, prohibited from owning property, from uh, owning like real estate, the Nisei generation ended up becoming the, the holders of that, um, those titles on behalf of their families. Um, so in this uh, kind of growing atmosphere um, of, uh, of kind of nativism and anti-Japanese uh, sentiment on the West Coast, uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked on December 7th, 1941 um, by the government of Japan. Um, the immediate result of this was that uh, several thousand uh, mainly Issei, uh, first generation Japanese immigrants, were rounded up by, um, by the FBI, by the, the army, and put into um, intern what, what were actually technically internment camps. So these were non-citizens who were placed into, were arrested and placed into custody, um, mainly because they were the heads of community organizations, uh, you know, Buddhist priests, the heads of uh, martial arts schools, and newspaper, Japanese language newspapers. Um, and this, uh, this went on for several months 
until February 19th of uh, 1942, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt signs Executive Order 9066, which authorized the removal and incarceration of, uh, at that time, about 110,000 persons of Japanese ancestry uh, just on the west coast of the U.S. Um, and that's important to note because there was actually a pushback in Hawaii uh, by the military authorities um, against incarcerating uh, Japanese Americans there because they were so important in the economy, the local economy in Hawaii. Um, it's also important to note that two thirds of the people who were uh, incarcerated uh, were American citizens. Um, these were Nisei, or these were second generation Nisei. Um, and again, their parents not being um, eligible for, uh, for citizenship, um, it, it's hard to say how much larger that number might have been. Um, so the uh, Wartime Relocation Authority, or the WRA, was the principal government authority involved, and they operated 10 large uh, camps, and these are referred to as concentration camps at the time by um, FDR and the authorities. Um, that name, of course, has is, is taken on a whole different meaning after um, the extermination camps were discovered in, uh, in Europe um, during the Holocaust. Uh, so this term is somewhat loaded, but this, again, is the term that was used um, at the time by, uh, by FDR. Um, there were also about 20 plus assembly centers, um, which were temporary uh, sites to detain people before the large camps were built. Um, it took several months to do that. So many people were held in um, you know, temporary facilities that included uh, Tanforan Racetrack in uh, Los Angeles. Um, it included the Puyallup Fairgrounds here in Washington State. Um, where people stayed in, sometimes in uh, the stables where uh, the animals had been housed. Um, once the permanent camps were built, uh, these people were uh, then, you know, sent to the, uh, the large incarceration camps. But there was also a network of about 100 other detention sites across the U.S. and Hawaii that were operated by the Army, Department of Justice, INS, and that first generation Issei, the several thousand of them who were rounded up um, during that first pass immediately following Pearl Harbor, uh, traveled, many of them were in five or six of these detention centers during the course of the war. Um, the last of the camps closed in uh, March of 1946 um, with Thule Lake. Um, oh, and I guess I should mention that in between another important event, um, was that in 1943, uh, the Army actually opened up the, um, uh, in, or opened up to the volunteer enlistment of Japanese Americans. So second generation Japanese Americans who were in camp could volunteer and uh, uh, some percentage did. And uh, this formed the 100th um, or also known as the 442nd uh, Regimental Combat Unit, which was a very decorated military unit um, of the army uh, in Europe, in the European theater. Um, there actually was a draft that started in 1944 as well, um, where, uh, and in that, the vast majority of um, Nisei who were eligible for the draft served, but there were also a small number of people who refused to serve and became conscientious objectors. Um, so again, in 1946, the last camp closed, and then there was a period for many, many years when no one really talked about this episode in American history. And it wasn't until uh, the late 60s, early 70s, when Asian American activists began to um, talk about it. And in the early 80s, the Congressional uh, or Congress uh, convened the Commission of Wartime Relocation and Internment of Citizens. Um, and this commission was to look at the incarceration and decide um, what the government's role had been and look at um, potential remedies to that, um, that experience. Um, this resulted in a series of hearings across the U.S. Um, where uh, many people told their stories for the first time um, and many of their neighbors had never heard these stories before. Um, in August of 1988, President Reagan 
signed uh, HR 442, also known as the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 into law. And this acknowledged finally uh, the government's role in, uh, in the incarceration and that it was unjust and uh, was an apology, um, but also a reparation payment to all of the people um, who were in the camps of $20,000. So uh, importantly, the, the uh, Civil Liberties Act outlines the three major causes of the incarceration, um, which they said were race prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership during the war. Um, I'll put one coda on this, which is that uh, very recently, uh, so there were four supreme, very important Supreme Court cases related to this, um, the most famous of which is probably the, uh, the Fred Korematsu case. Um, and it was only several years ago that the decision of the Supreme Court that was made in the in 1944 um, from the Korematsu case that ruled that the um, incarceration was uh, legal, even though it was based in um, on a uh, on a, a, a racial um, uh, or had a racial basis to it. Um, Korematsu was finally overturned uh, just several years ago, so stood as good law um, up until that point. So with that, I'm going to, and, I'm, and I'll say it as well, that there's a lot more information on our website that's just a very brief overview, um, but we have a nice series of videos um, that you can see at densho.org um, if you go there to, and want to learn more. So let's talk a little bit about Densho itself. Um, so we were formed in 1995, 1996 by members, really a small group of community volunteers here in Seattle, namely Sansei, which is third generation, to throw another term in there. Um, and they were concerned that their parents, uh, the people who had experienced the incarceration firsthand, were aging. And aside from, again, the CWRIC experience, really had never shared their stories. I mean, many of these uh, third generation um, people in their, you know, at that time in their, in their 40s and, and maybe early 50s um, knew nothing about their parents' experience during, uh, during World War II. And they were concerned that that story would be lost. So again, with that mission, so first to capture the stories um, before uh, people were gone, and then really to use those stories to educate, promote, and advance the ideals of democracy and encourage civic engagement. Um, and so we didn't really come to this work originally thinking that we would be establishing an archival institution. Um, but after two decades, that's really where we are now. So I'm going to pass it over to Sarah, who's going to take a step back and talk about the definition of a community-based organization and sort of what differentiates it from a traditional archival organization and some of the features that we have here at Densho that make it really community-based. All right, so what is actually community archive? So when we were thinking about this, we actually looked up and there's no actual like, definite definition about it. But I think the most important thing to take away is that community archives are always an independent organization. So we are not tied to any sort of uh, college or government institution or a company or a corporation. And this really gives a community, whoever they are, uh, and control over how you collect and preserve and then make a history, their history, available to the wider public. So there are many different types of communities an archive can establish around. Dinshaw, obviously, uh, we are established around sort of an ethnic identity, but also around a, an event, uh, especially the incarceration. So the archive has expanded a little bit beyond that. We do a little bit before and a little bit after, but those are the two things that sort of tie our community together. But if you're looking for other community archives or you want to establish your own, there's many other ways you can bring a community together. So a community archive can be built around like a geographic community, so your neighborhood, a town, um, a geographic area. I worked with one that was based off of a, uh, a river valley. We were the Wabash River Valley uh, Visions and Voices. Um, and then you can also base it around, like I said, an event. So we have the incarceration. I've heard of other community archives that are built around um, such events such as 9-11 or um, a World's Fair, something like that. 
And then also you have sort of special interest communities. So you can build a community archive around uh, sort of one thing that a group of people have in common, such as like an LGBT archive, um, or even a shared vocation, or an industry that you all work in. Okay, we're just gonna switch this slide here. So what also makes a community archive different? So one of the first things I like to talk about is since Dinsho is a digital archive, we have what I call a catch and release program. So Dinsho doesn't actually have a physical archive on site. We do not keep any of the physical collections. So what we do is we solicit for our community to bring in collections, photo albums, um, scrapbooks, uh, we've gotten boxes of letters, documentation, ephemera, the whole spiel, and then we, uh, we scan it and then we always give it back to the family. We do not keep it. So uh, this allows us to concentrate really on just keeping our digital files up to date and keeping them there keeping them secure and available for the public and using it onto our website. Uh, we also are very steeped in uh, outreach. So to find these collections, we solicit versus uh, by sending out materials. The latest one is the History Keepers, which was basically just a um, sort of flyer that asked for people, if, you know, if you're the person who ended up with all the photographs and stuff from your parents, you might want to uh, let us digitize it and keep it for prosperity. So uh, we do that through our collection nominations form. So someone goes to our website and they ask about it and they can fill out the form and we can decide whether or not we uh, would like to digitize it. Which brings me to the final point uh, we have up here is that we have a very two-way street with our donors. We are always communicating with them, um, whether or not it's to figure out what they have. Um, we also talk to them about what they don't want to be made public. Uh, we ask them for background information so we can add um, sort, of, sort of context to like these photos and these documents and the ephemera that they have there, which is actually really helpful. <laughs> also, write the names of people that you know on the back of your photographs now. <laughs> as someone who, who wonders who people are in photographs on a daily basis. But, um, and then uh, our last final part is that, which I've said earlier, our oral histories, which uh, we are going to go to next. Right, so, all right, thank you, Sarah. So, um, capturing oral history was really the beginning of our work. This was our original, our original work. And the voices of, we really think that the voices of our interviewees or who we call our narrators um, give life to the history. And uh, I'm gonna play you just a brief clip so you'll have an idea of some of the, um, the types of materials that you find in our oral history collections. Um, I'm gonna set this clip up by just giving you a little bit of background. Uh, this is a woman, Kara Kondo, who is a, a Nisei, a second generation. And she's going to talk about the day of mass removal in early June of 1942, when she and her family um, were put on a military train uh, from their town in Wapato, Washington, um, to the North Portland Assembly Center, uh, which was the temporary detention center where she would stay for about three months before going to um, Heart Mountain. Um, and she reflects on some of those, some of those memories. So let me play this clip for you. As we pulled out, I can remember my father uh, <clears throat> holding on to the arm of his uh, the seat, hard seat. The blinds had been withdrawn, but you could before they did that, you could see the shadow of the Mount Adams and the sun behind it, and. <clears throat> And looking at his face, I could just uh, feel that he was saying goodbye to the place that he had known so well. Uh, pictures like that, just really, when you think about it, very sad. But it was, it was such a, it's hard to explain the kind of feeling, the atmosphere of that time. But uh, it's. Uh, and we went and traveled through the night uh, with the shades drawn and, and got to Portland Livestock Center, our, our <clears throat> evacuation center, about at really about dawn. 
and uh, uh, I stayed until the last person got in the into the compound and I heard the gate clang behind me and I think when people ask, uh, uh, ask what my memory was uh, about evacuation I think I'll always remember the sound of the gate clanging yeah I knew and knowing that you were finally under <clears throat> you were had barbed wires around you and uh, you were really being interned So I think it's oh, the slide there. Um, I mean, it's really these these voices that we um, that we value the most um, because they really are the voices of our of our community. Um, and all of this material is available through our website, um, and that's uh, through the Densha Digital Repository. You can see ddr.densha.org. Um, the interviews are fully transcribed and not edited except uh, to remove uh, some breaks and, and those sorts of things. Um, we do segment them into three to five minute clips uh, to make them easy to, uh, to find and, and uh, use. And all of the available, all the materials available again for free. Um, we have about 842, or sorry, 824 narrators, um, 1,022 interviews, and over 2,000 hours of video and audio available right now on the site. Um, so we were awarded a grant project to conduct some new interviews uh, recently, and we're doing a little bit of that. But for the most part, um, our collecting activities now are through digitizing and preserving interviews that were conducted, um, many of them by other organizations during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So we're transferring uh, things from older video formats and from uh, audio, sometimes audio tape and audio formats um, into a digital format that we can preserve for, for the long term. Um, you know, our activities around oral history, unfortunately, um, are beginning to uh, decline. And that's simply because the, uh, the, the people who were incarcerated the Nisei generation um, is uh, disappearing. So, you know, with that, as we've begun to ramp down our focus on oral history over the last seven or eight years, um, we've shifted our collection focus to um, photographs, documents, and other historical materials from the community. Uh, and again, you know, you can see all of this oral history material through our website, um, and it will also be mixed with this photographic uh, document and uh, other uh, material, uh, which Sarah will talk about now. All right. So yeah, uh, we when I first came in, starting as an intern in 2015, uh, one of the things that we were set on doing uh, is collecting historical materials, and we were actually reaching out to old narrator families. Uh, so really, we were trying to uh, sort of bolster the full experience. So you have the narrators and their memories and hearing it straight from their voices, but we're also now collecting and digitizing materials that sort of give um, a look into the materials of the day, the photographs their letters, um, the ephemera, and the scrapbooks they save, so you get even more of a full picture. Um, so things they might not remember might be shown in these uh, other materials that we can show you. So, um, so unlike the institutional archives that we talked about before, a business government or university archive, uh, that receives materials sort of a constant base, they're always bringing things in, um, you sort of have your sort of retention schedule that you have to go through. Uh, we as a community archive, I actually have to seek out and solicit it, like I did when I was uh, first started as an intern uh, for our community for a collection. So that means that we don't have, you will never really have a set uh, input schedule. So uh, sometimes you won't have that much new materials coming in. And then sometimes, especially after you put out a call out for materials, all of a sudden you are inundated with materials and you somehow do not have enough scanners or people to get through it. So it's uh, a different sort of challenge of being a community digital archive. Um, another difference uh, with our historical materials than for us as a community archives is that we work with partners, uh, which is also something that I've seen as a common uh, similarity across all community archives. 
So um, we work with other community organizations, uh, sort of like ONI or the Pacific Citizen that the Japanese American Citizen League puts out, um, or other institutions like the Japanese American National Museum. Um, these, as you can see, like in the slide we have here, these pictures and this collection that I chose is actually part of the Heart Mountain Wyoming uh, Foundation. So they are also one of our partners so your repository or your collection and your archive can be a lot larger if you I sort of reach out to other people in your community and you bring it all together. Uh, so also, as you can see on the slide, uh, we have sort of tweaked the sort of normal metadata that you would see um, in somewhere that they would do like a uh, Dublin core or other uh, outlines of metadata. So we're going to talk about that a little bit in the next slide here. So uh, of course the DDR or digital repository has the common search feature, but what I really like to show people that is very uh, connected with our community is our browse features, which as you can see can be uh, by narrator, uh, collection, but what I really want to talk, or facility, but what I really want to talk about is the topics. So um, I really think that another great part of a community archive is that we can make our own controlled vocabularies, which is what our uh, topics source is. Uh, this we also have worked a lot with our partners to uh, come up with this, especially when we were first starting. But instead of leaning on LOC, which really doesn't have the vocabulary to talk about and um, catalog our materials, we have come up with our own, which is a lot of hard work to start out with. But um, I think it's really worth it because we can get down to like the nitty gritty. And so people who are browsing our materials can find lots of stuff. So as you can see on the right of the slide, I have pulled out our food <laughs> topic, uh, which talks about um, what the food was like when they were in the uh, incarceration camps. And as you can see, it brings up both our historical materials and our um, clips from our interviews that all deal with this. Um, and also don't be worried uh, if you have a community archive, I've also seen people who've done hybrid vocabularies where they bring a little bit from LOC, but they also have a smaller uh, controlled vocabulary that they've come up with themselves. And then uh, now that you've seen our sort of polished front end of everything and what everything turns out looking like, I'm gonna get into a little bit of the nitty gritty about what our collection workflow is like. So what happens behind the scenes? How do we get from a call to materials to what you see on our website? So for example, um, I just went out and got a new collection recently. So um, we had a member of the community contact and show after we sent out the History Keeper mailer and she filled out the nomination form and we decided that um, her material she had would be a really nice addition to our archive. And so myself and our current assistant archivist, Cameron, we went out to the community, she lived local, and we went and picked up the materials. So it ended up being 12 different photo albums from both her parents and an aunt and uncle of hers. And we also collected two uh, boxes of documents. And um, we always have our um, community members who are, are giving us their materials for uh, digitization. We have them sign a loan form so we both know exactly what we took and when we took it, who was there. And then um, I went, I'm now in the middle of scanning the materials. Um, we have a picture in the lower left-hand corner of our head archivist, Caitlin, using our book drive, which um, I will have to use for some of the photo albums that are bound and I cannot take apart. Um, we also use flatbed scanners and a copy stand. And then we record all of our metadata while we are doing scanning in a spreadsheet, which you can see our standard spreadsheet. It has a field for each of our, um, metadata fields that we have. And then after everything is uh, scanned, we do image processing. So this is spread across Photoshop for cropping, color correction, and any other, and straightening any other things we need to do. And then we forward it into, if we need to, Adobe Acrobat. So that would be making PDFs of like full album collections. So you can view it as one continuous album or any sort of documents or letters we combine those into an easily accessible PDF. And then everything uh, 
well, let's see here. Well, then sometimes between finishing scanning and image processing, we'll clear, we'll return the collection somewhere in there. Um, sometimes we have to pick them up or if they're farther afield, uh, we actually do do mailings in between us and whoever is donating the collection for us to digitize. And then we move on to our editor, which you can see on the right. Um, Oh, okay. Sorry, I'll slow down. <laughs> She's in the middle of her third cup of coffee. So. Yeah. <laughs> so on the right, you can see our editor. So this is our back end. So this is what it looks like when we go in and we input the metadata and our images, uh, both our master to files that we get from scanning and then our mezzanines, which are usually smaller, um, uh, smaller files of the edited versions that have been through the Photoshop process or the Adobe Acrobat process that uh, will be easier to view on the front end of the website. So after the input and editor and everything has been processed, we always also create JPEG files and burn a CD of them uh, for uh, the people who donate the collection. So actually our community members get digital files of everything that they loan for us to put up on the website. We go with JPEGs because they're normal, they're easier to put on CDs and um, the families don't really need archival quality. And if they ever need it, uh, all of these materials are available for free and they can re-download anything that um, they might lose or anything like that. Um, and then uh, once we send them the CD, we also always include a release form uh, that gives uh, us permission to publish uh, our collection publicly. And uh, at this point, did we also talk about anything that might need to be selected as private, um, any sort of information they don't want out to the general public. So sometimes this means certain letters that they feel are too personal or something they just don't want to share. Uh, we'll put as private for our website. Um, this is also redacting any uh, any personal information before we publish it onto the website. Uh, and then after that, we publish it. We let them know that it's uh, up for uh, viewing. And we also encourage them to look through and if we've gotten anything wrong, um, if any names are wrong, um, if they want to tell us something about something that's up there, like they know who that person is in a photograph that we've put as unidentified, they can let us know and we can actually update that and then push it back up to our public website. So, and sometimes remember the communities will let us know if something ends up breaking <laughs> on the way from the back end to the front end. But um, that is sort of the full workflow from picking something up and to putting it into our editor to publishing it on the website. If you want even more of an interactive view of what it's like to uh, pick up one of our collections and go through it, uh, we actually have a video on YouTube. Um, it's the unboxing history video. And if you just put that into the search with Dinsho, or we can give you the URL later. But yeah, that is another collection that we've gotten that we did like the whole process to show you. Yeah. And I'll just um, add that um, we have a uh, like a collection workflow manual that uh, details much of the uh, process, particularly for our image collections, um, including the standards that we apply um, and uh, the you know various parts of the the, the process itself. Yes. Um, you know the uh, metadata dictionary and. All those things so if you'd like to have that that's also available um, we circulate that manual as well um, in addition the software platform we're using is uh, something that um, that we developed in-house and that is also um, open source and available uh, through our github site um, so if there's any interest uh, in that you know please please contact us um, so with that, uh, you know, so we've spent a lot of time um, putting together these archival resources and we have tens of thousands of, but I think it's, oh, I, I want to say it's around 60,000 objects now, something like that. Um, yeah, in the, over um, hundreds of collections. Yeah, over hundreds of collections in the, uh, in the DDR. Um, but it's not enough really just to collect these archival resources and, and present them. Um, we feel it's really important to, uh, you know, for these, 
these resources to remain uh, valuable, they have to remain relevant and get used. So one of the things that we've recognized is that understanding the context behind the objects is really important. Um, and this really led uh, several years ago to the creation of what we call the Densho Encyclopedia, which is a, and you can see there's a URL down there, encyclopedia.densho.org. And this is a curated collection of more than a thousand articles. Um, these are written by a pool of uh, about a hundred scholars and researchers and other subject matter experts on a vast variety of topics, um, including key individuals, uh, key events, uh, the court cases, um, many of the laws uh, that you know were passed during the pre-war period and, and after the war, um, and then descriptions of all the camps and facilities that were used in the incarceration. Um, there's information about the Japanese American military units like the 442 and the 522nd and others. Um, and all of these articles have a, a lot of links back to primary source materials that are from the archives. And we use these primary source materials directly from that collection workflow in, in the uh, encyclopedia itself. Um, Likewise, from the Densho Digital Repository, if you're browsing through the Densho topics vocabulary terms, there are links back to relevant articles in the encyclopedia. So we feel, again, it's very important uh, to provide that context so that people understand the objects that they're, that they're looking at. Yes, I use the Densho Encyclopedia a lot when I first started since I didn't have a big historical background in the subject matter. So. And I still use it even yes. though I've been here a long time. So. <laughs> it's yes. true. It's a good fact check for all of us as well. Exactly. Um, and we're continuing to add articles to that encyclopedia. Um, so the encyclopedia gives background and context to the history, but the other important way that we feel um, we can keep the history relevant is by connecting it to current events. And one of the primary ways we do that is through our curriculum. Um, we have uh, what we call the Learning Center. So uh, again, the, the URL is down at the bottom here. And this is probably the best place to find um, all of our, our curriculum pieces and other educational um, products. Um, again, all of this is, it, I say product, all of it is free, um, but it's all available uh, from this site. Um, we have a, a number of curriculum packages that are based on uh, what are called visible thinking routines, which is uh, were developed uh, in cooperation with um, Ron Richard, who's a researcher at the Harvard School of Education's Project Zero. Um, and uh, we use our oral history materials. We heavily use our photos and documents um, in the curriculum. So that there really is a balance of learning how to use and evaluate primary source materials with uh, the information about civil liberties and about the history of the Japanese American uh, incarceration. Um, we examine issues of uh, race and discrimination through oral history, as you can see with our curriculum guide. Um, and very recently, we released a resource guide um, that's kind of based on the encyclopedia that is a very large directory of books, films, video, and other online curriculum related to the Japanese American incarceration. And all of that is um, searchable by grade level, by reading level, if that applies, um, and by a variety of other, um, other facets. So I encourage you to take a look at that too. That You can find that link through the Learning Center, um, but it's also just resourceguide.densho.org. Uh, finally, um, we're engaged really actively in outreach, uh, particularly through social media and events. And we, again, use the archival resources heavily um, when we uh, uh, are engaged in our social media. Um, so you see a flyer here from a, a recent event that we held, uh, which is called the Day of Remembrance. Um, and this is held every February 19th to commemorate the anniversary of the uh, issuance of Executive Order 9066. Um, so this year, um, we had an event with um, activist and gold star father uh, Kizer Khan and the musician uh, Kishibashi. Um, and Kizer Khan gave a very 
uh, a very moving speech about uh, the connection between the Japanese American um, incarceration experience and uh, some of the things that are happening today in our immigration debate. Um, that's available through our uh, YouTube site. Um, there's a full uh, stream or a full uh, archive of that web stream um, that's available. Um, we also are very active on uh, Facebook, um, on Twitter, and on Instagram. And you can find us at Densho Project on Twitter and Instagram, and at Facebook at uh, slash Densho Project. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Sarah, and I think we're going to wrap up here. Yeah, so as you can see, uh, being a successful community archive is hard work, just like uh, making mochi, as you can see here. Uh, so what you really need is a solid definition of what or who defines you. So make sure you have that first, and also understand the, po the politics of your community, because the last thing you want to do is step on anyone's toes when you are uh, trying to build some sort of trust between you and the people who are donating materials and who are going to be supporting you in uh, your endeavors. Um, also, those building those connections will take uh, time and work, especially if you're a, a professional and you're coming from outside the community. Um, you sort of have to step back and let the community members tell you how you want to treat your like treat their historical materials and how they want them to be put out there for the whole world to see. And then uh, be really prepared to respond to questions about your motivations and intentions. Um, we do this a lot with us. There's a lot of back and forth with the community and Tom, our executive director, is always sort of polling the community to see what they feel and which ways we should go and what we should focus on into the future. So it's always going to be a dialogue. You can never just lay down the law <laughs> and tell them this is how it's going to be. Um, you always have to have really that back and forth with the people that you're trying to represent. Great. And with that, um, we'll say thank you again. Um, to all of you for attending today and for your interest in the project and and again to Alex for uh, for allowing us to uh, to share this with you and I'd encourage you to come by our site at uh, densho.org um, and use all of these resources um, and uh, follow us on social media I'm, I'm supposed to say that apparently from our communications director so um, <laughs> please, please do um, and if there are any questions I don't see any in the stream but if there are any questions um, that you think of after this presentation that you'd like to ask us later, uh, please feel free to contact uh, either one of us or just to go directly to the site and, and use our contact form as well. Uh, so with that, I'll say thank you very much for having us today. Uh, hey, Jeff. I have a couple questions, actually, oh, that have okay. come in. Great. Okay. Um, and just a reminder to everyone uh, participating, if you have a question for Jeff and Sarah, just go ahead and pop it into the questions pane that's on the right. Um, so uh, one question that came in is, how do you locate and how do you contact people for collections and find people for collections in oral history, especially people who aren't maybe on the West Coast anymore if families have migrated? Yeah, well, that um, really comes through our, our network of um, connections to other organizations. So um, we've been doing this work for quite a long time, and we've built um, very strong relationships with um, uh, you know, a variety of different Japanese American organizations across the US. So uh, with uh, local chapters of the Japanese American Citizens League, um, to other community groups, um, sometimes to other small archives. And many times what we end up doing is bringing some expertise in to assist them in doing, conducting the interviews. Um, and then we will host the interviews on our site. And so Sarah kind of alluded to this before, the, um, the way that the Dead Show Digital Repository is set up is that we have um, ourselves, but then a variety of partners. And the partners um, have pretty much complete control over what they would like to have represented in their partner collections. And we all share the platform. So we maintain the platform and maintain a lot of the infrastructure, but the partners really provide um, a, a decent portion, probably about half of the content. So. Yeah, and then with personal collections, when people reach out to us and they don't live in the area, um, 
what we do, uh, we ask them if they feel comfortable in uh, FedExing uh, us the materials. And it's totally up to them. Um, and uh, we pay for it, obviously. And then we send it back. Uh, that eh, yeah. usually people do that. Sometimes uh, we have gone out into the other communities mm -hmm. and we personally bring back collections as well. Uh, but yeah, it's mostly through the connections that we have through the Japanese American community. Yeah, we're West Coast based, but we, we've been spending a lot of time over the last, especially the last uh, three or four years uh, traveling to other areas where there were big Japanese American populations. I mean, there was a large uh, population um, who went from camp to Chicago, for mm -hmm. example, um, during, uh, actually during the, the incarceration period, um, because they were not, uh, they were not welcomed back on the West Coast. So uh, there was a, a fairly large population who went to school and resettled in Chicago. Uh, St. Louis also has a, a population. Um, and uh, we were just recently in New York as well um, and spent uh, about a week there uh, with a bunch of our staff, so. Great. Um, we have a question here about working in translation. Have you done any oral histories in translation and how did that work out for you? Yeah, that's a very, that's a very complicated, um, uh, complicated thing. Yes, we, we have, the answer is yes. Um, we have some um, in Japanese. Uh, we actually have, I believe, several in uh, Spanish uh, because there were um, Japanese Peruvians um, and uh, Japanese Argentinians and some other uh, South American uh, uh, immigrants who were sent to the United States um, to camps in the U.S. during the wartime period as well. Um, we have, uh, as well, some, uh, interviews in Japanese, although very small number. I mean, it's really, uh, there, there's no magic formula other than having good translators available, um, to do that work. Of course, we, most, the vast majority of our interviews are in, um, in English. Um, but, you know, if we have an opportunity to interview someone, um, in, in Japanese, and that's the only language that, that we can do it. We're we're going to do that. Um, yeah, it's it. It's a, yeah, I wish I could say there was like a a piece of software that we use, and we just dump the interview in, and it uh, it automatically translates it. But it doesn't quite work that way yet. Maybe maybe <laughs> maybe, maybe soon. Maybe in ten years or or five years. Who knows? Great. Um, we have a couple questions here that are sort of about where people can find um, some of the things that you've produced, like your workflow manual, um, any details about your open source platform, kind of the nuts and bolts. Is that stuff available? Um, there's a little bit of that available. We actually uh, fairly recently <laughs> took down the site where we used to post the, uh, the manual itself. But probably the best way right now, um, and that's we're, we're planning on putting that back up, the best way right now is to contact us directly, um, and we can we'll be more than happy to uh, to give you a copy of the manual. Um, we also have a, a site on GitHub at uh, GitHub.com/denshow, and you can browse all of our repos um, uh, if you're so inclined. And there's um, actually a manual repo up there that contains some information about kind of the platform itself. Again, that's not as, as structured as we'd like it to be because we originally just developed the software for, for us to use. Um, but if there is, if, you know, people have an interest, um, you know, please feel free again to contact us and uh, we'll be more than happy to talk about it with you. And we have another question or two that um, kind of are wondering about the digital preservation infrastructure mm -hmm. that that you work with, you know, like how are you managing that? Do you get support from universities or um, do you have an internal system for that? We do that all in house. Um, so again, the software layer um, is uh, primarily based on uh, on the Git infrastructure. So if people are familiar with using Git, GitHub for uh, source control. 
We use Git along with something called Git Annex, which is for storing large files, large binary files within Git. Um, and this allows us to have um, uh, sort of bit fixity and the ability to um, to check kind of inline hash uh, of all of the objects in the repository and also control all of the uh, provenance of the metadata as well. Um, so that's our, our software is built on top of that, that platform, um, kind of at the software layer. Uh, from the hardware layer, we have uh, a, a large um, enterprise storage array um, in-house. And then we use uh, Backblaze as our cloud, primary cloud backup platform and then have uh, hard drives that go to um, offsite physical storage. Um, In-house, we have uh, at least three, or no, sorry, at least, no, at least three copies of all of our data. So on our primary um, enterprise storage array, on a secondary backup array, and then kind of on a commodity, lousy USB array. Um, and that process, again, is managed um, largely through our software. So um, we, we started really, I mean, I, one of the pieces of background that I probably should have mentioned is that uh, one of our executive director, Tom, and one of our principal founders, uh, Scott um, Oki, uh, were both at Microsoft for many years before they came to this work. And so we've always had uh, this strong technology focus. Um, so we do maintain, we, we do have a lot of that expertise in-house. And I'd be more than happy to talk with people. Um, I'm primarily responsible for that part. So anybody who has any other questions uh, more in depth, please please feel free to contact me. Um, there's one question asking if people can volunteer on any of your projects, uh, like translating, even uh, if they are not in Seattle. Oh, translating. Yes, answer, <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, we, if, we actually, you, yeah. if you can translate Japanese. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually do have um, a, a, uh, a pretty strong core of volunteers who've done a lot of transcription and translation. Um, we, one of our big projects right now is what we're calling the Names Registry. And this is, um, so during, you know, during the camp period, um, and immediately following the, the camps upon closure, there was a census done at each one of the individual camps. This was called the final accountability report. Um, and it was like an, a, a roster of all the people who were in the camp and some basic background information. Um, this is in you know, PDF form now, scanned off of microfilm, and uh, is not easily OCRable because it's just a complete mess of handwriting and all kinds of stuff. So uh, we've had a bunch of volunteers working on that uh, recently. Um, we do also have volunteers work with um, Japanese language translation, and we do have Japanese language materials, particularly letters and documents yes. um, that we need to have translated. So many letters in Japanese. So if you are willing to do that out there, we would be very, very happy to, uh, yes, <laughs> to have you contact us. And there is information on our site, on our, uh, our main website, in our frequently asked questions about how to volunteer. But you can also just contact us directly. That would be fine. Yes, so many materials that I haven't been able to describe because I can't read Japanese. Yes, lots of journals. and Lots of journals, lots like of letters. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you both so much um, for this great presentation. Uh, I also want to give another thanks to all of our Preservation Week sponsors. Thanks to their generosity, we were able to offer this session at no cost. And thank you to all of our attendees for participating today. We hope you found the session useful. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form along with links to the recording and the slides. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELEC CE committee improve its webinars and plan future events. ELEC now offers certificates of attendance to webinar participants. More information on this will be included in the email that you receive. Information about all ELEC webinars can be found on the ELEC homepage. Please check out the web courses and upcoming e-forums. Suggestions for webinars and other continuing education opportunities are also welcome at any time. You can contact any member of the ELEC CE committee or submit a proposal for a webinar using the online form on the ELEX webpage under online learning. 
I also want to thank Catherine Balick for providing technical support for today's webinar. The support she and her colleagues on the technical support subcommittee provide make it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and we hope you'll participate in other Alex continuing education events and other preservation week events this week. Bye, y'all.